unfortunately, these are the things we have to battle with. Sometimes some, some people are flagging the video and I don't know, I mean, and uh, the thing will just freeze and but we have to battle with this and these are the limitations of um, this kind of technology. You are not in control of Facebook and people are there that are appointed by the devil to distract other people. And so they'll be touching something and then the thing will be freezing. Well, regardless of what is happening, we're going to continue and, uh, and uh, God is going to be glorified. So I was saying that faith is very, very critical, very critical. The Bible says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Hebrews 11 verse 6, there is no other currency that is acceptable to God but faith. Everything about the believer's work in life is faith. To receive Jesus is by faith. Salvation is free. But you need to open up your heart and receive it by faith. Everything is rooted in faith. But there is a difference between faith and trust. And when you hear these two words being used interchangeably, sometimes among believers, I trust God. I have faith in God. I trust God. And Many times we don't know that the difference between these two words is major. Now, faith is, I believe that God will do what he has said he will do. And then I am acting on that information. God has told me something or I have read something in the scripture and then I am acting on that word. That is faith. Acting on advanced information from God. That is faith. Now you know what trust is? Faith we say, I believe what God has said is going to do, it will do. And then I'm acting on it. Trust is, I believe what God has said it will do. And then I am acting on that thing. But even if God does not do that thing, my position remains the same. Even if he doesn't do it, at the time he says he's going to do it, I am not going to change. I'm not going to shift ground. I remain committed to him. This was exactly what happened in the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego story. So our God whom we serve will deliver us. That is faith. And then they said, even if he does not deliver us, we are not going to bow to your image, O king. So they moved from faith to trust. So you can't trust God if you don't have faith in him. Trust is a high level, higher level of relationship. Trust is, I don't care what happens. Even if God does not answer me on the seventh day or on the tenth day, I will still be committed to him. I will still remain loyal to him. I will still be serving him. Provoking uncommon rewards through a life of faith. Faith in difficult times. Faith in difficult times. You can never guarantee that there won't be challenges in your life. I can't guarantee you that myself. Life is full of challenges, upheavals, uncertainties. You need to develop your faith. I will get that very soon. Because the only thing that will sustain you in the day of trial, in the day of challenge, is your faith in God. And it is easier to have faith in God when things, when you have options. It is easier to have faith in God when a lady has three children and is trusting God for the fourth child. You have three children and you are trusting God for the fourth child. You, I mean, that is a level of faith. I have faith in God. You'll be waiting on God. But a woman who is 45 year old, years old and has no child. And if she too is having faith in God, your faith is on different level. Because faith is not at the same level. Everybody has measures of faith. Measures of faith. Jesus said to the apostles, if you will have faith like a grain of mustard seed, which already tells you and I that faith is in degree. In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 8 and 9, Apostle Paul identified faith. As a gift of the spirit. It's called special faith. The gift of special faith. That is not ordinary faith. That is a kind of a faith that you will put a man inside a wilderness. 
there is nothing there that is growing. It is a dry ground. And the person will tell you, I want to start farming tomorrow. And you tell him, are you crazy? He will tell you, God told me I should farm. He will not consider anything, anything biological. His mind is wired around what God has said. Even under the most difficult situation, it is called the, the, the gift of faith or special faith. Praise the Lord. And I'm still building up. I'm going to enter to the mainstream of this teaching now. No, God's servant of blessed memory, Rhea Bunky, he used to tell his associates, anytime they faced critical challenge in ministry, Rhea Bunky will tell his associates, trust God, trust God, God will help us. And then, when they are struggling to trust God, Rhea Bunky will say, if you cannot trust God, trust me, and I will trust God. <laughs> if you cannot trust God, just trust me, and I will trust God. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5, Proverbs 3, verse 5, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not on your own, unto your own understanding. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Now, not a quarter of your heart, not a third of your heart, not trusting in God with one eye, and looking at somebody else with another eye. Psalms 34 verse 5 says, They looked unto him and they, they were lightened, and their faces were not ashamed. They looked unto him. And we all make these mistakes, including myself. When we have problems and challenges, the first person we look at is our friend. The first person we look at is our uncle. The first person we look at is the government. And that is not supposed to be. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 33, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all other things shall be added unto you. The word first is the most important word in that verse of the Bible. Other statements are equally, sorry, they are also very important, but that word first, not just seeking him at all, seeking him first. And this also speaks to the issue of having faith and trust in God. Anytime there is challenge around your life, who is the first person that takes precedence? The first person you speak to. Do you, do you even have, have any space in your heart to have a quiet time of prayer? Father, in the name of Jesus, I have just, I have just lost my job. What do I do? I cast all my cares upon you. I need a new job. When you make God first, you are provoking something in the realm of the Spirit. You are telling him that above every other source, above every other person on earth, you have confidence in him. You have confidence. That does not mean that you won't talk to people. That doesn't mean that you won't make effort. But the first person that should take priority in the time of crisis, in the time of need, is God. Because every other person can be speaking until God has spoken. Every other person can be speaking until God has spoken. After God has spoken, every other voice is a noise. After God has spoken, every other speaker is a noisemaker. And that is what David was saying in Psalm 34 verse 5. They looked unto him, not unto their hunkus, not unto the economy of their nations. Not unto the economy of their countries. They looked unto him and they were lightened and their faces were not ashamed. They looked unto him. Who are you looking up to in this season? Everything is rocking the world. The world is shaken. You, you, are, you are almost caged in fear. COVID-19 is killing people in thousands across the globe. By adventure, you have lost your job. By adventure, something has happened to you, and you are in the midst of uncertainty. I don't know what I'm going to do. Psalm 34 verse 5 says, they looked unto him. This is a word for someone. You have been looking at every other person but God. You have been looking, and then when you look at people and they disappoint you, you get upset. And then you pick up quarrels with them. No, you are looking in the wrong direction. Look unto him. Look unto him. Do not put trust in any human being. 
Men will help you. They will sit down there. Use that help to mock you later in future. If it was not me, you wouldn't have been married. If it was not me, you wouldn't have been employed. It is better for God to select for you whom he will use than for you yourself to be going about looking for who to help you. And I'm speaking about that contextually. I'm not saying that people should not, you shouldn't talk to people to help you when you have crisis. But make God first. Pray about that problem first. Open up your heart to the Holy Spirit to lead you. You may think the right person to talk to is your uncle. But the right person actually is your neighbor. That is where the Spirit of God will come in and steer your heart. Talk to your neighbor. And you don't know, you didn't even know that your neighbor is the HR. The HR director of a big company. And he just spoke to her. I go, oh, wow, can I have your CV? Before you say, Jack, an interview has been scheduled for you. And you got a job. Now let's dive into the mainstream of this teaching now. I've just laid a foundation about what faith does. The most difficult thing in life is to walk by faith in the time of crisis. Go and ask anybody that has faced trouble and crisis. I have faced so many of them. And then you wake up in the morning, you can't even figure out how that, how that problem will be solved. You are in the midst of an ocean. The waves of the ocean are beating on you. You can't even share that problem with anyone. There is no one you trust enough to, to steward that story, that secret for you. And you are reading the Bible and the Holy Spirit is saying, have faith in God. How can I have faith in God? My husband is in the hospital, he's dying. I have been scheduled to face a disciplinary panel next week. There is nobody that can help me out. And you are having that impression in your heart, have faith in God. For having faith in the time of difficulty. Let me tell you a story. In 1991, the U.S. government went to Iraq. The Iraq War of 1991. And a man was appointed by the U.S. government. The name of the man is General Krulak. General Krulak. He was supposed to be in charge of the Marines. Now, when they got to their base in Iraq, in Baghdad, they needed a particular base that had water because as soldiers you can't you can't even function on the battlefield without access to water so they combed every part of that particular base searching for water general kulak and all his soldiers experienced marines these are u.s marines were u.s marines who were already battle they were they, they loved war. <laughs> These are guys that have been trained. Some are commandos. They combed everywhere looking for water. Now, you can't be going into the enemy's camp to be asking them for water. So they couldn't go to the Iraqis or the Iranians or whatever. So because otherwise they would just walk into the trap of the enemy. They can even give them water that is poisoned. So they were looking for how to get water. They dug, they tried to dig, you, can't, you cannot even dig because it was a wilderness environment. The old ground was dry. What are we going to do? It was 14 days to the, to the start of the Iraq war. General Kulak was, was, was sad. What kind of a preparation is this? Did we make any mistake? How, will, they, will the US government be supplying us water from America? The, how, how many gallons of water will be supplied? So they were the the it was a very serious time of the war. But General Kruger was a believer in Christ. He was a Christian. So he kept praying. He kept praying. We need water. We need water. And he held on to God. He kept his faith in God. We need water. We need water. You know what happened? On the Sunday that was preceding the Monday that the war will start. One of the servants or one of the soldiers in the camp was just walking about aimlessly and he just stumbled at a particular patch of ground and he saw a water pipe there, a water pipe. 
he quickly ran back to the camp and he called the attention of General Krulak. They said he was telling a lie. They had searched everywhere. They had combed everywhere looking for water. They couldn't find water. When they got to this point, they saw a pipe, a 15 foot tall pipe that was producing 100,000 gallons of water per day. The exact quantity of water that the whole battalion of Marines needed to survive the wilderness all through the Iraqi war of 1991. The, there was no one that could explain how that water came. And it, it became a story among the U.S. Army, something they brand or they have branded the miracle water. Who provided that water? They had combed everywhere. They couldn't find water. They tried to dig the ground. They couldn't find water. Now, you don't know what it means to be in a wilderness, in a desert, and you have thousands of soldiers answering to you as a commander, and they didn't have water to drink, and you are fighting war on an enemy's ground. They were not in America, they were in Iraq. And they had to start the war the second day. It was a Sunday that the miracle happened. And there is no other way, there was no other way to explain this mystery than to attribute it to miracle. They could, who built the water? Who built, it was massive, who built it? How will water appear in the desert? Who built it? When I first heard this story, I couldn't believe it myself. I couldn't believe it. If not that I trusted the source, I trusted the man that shared the story, up until after the war, the CNN interviewed General Krulak about the same story. He said he cannot explain what happened. The Iraqi government couldn't have built that thing there. They had searched everywhere. We didn't see anything there. And I remember the story of Abraham and Agar. When Agar was running away from Abraham, and Agar, the servant of Abraham, carried Ishmael, and they had no water. And the baby was crying, and the angel of God appeared and opened the eyes of Agar, and he saw water. There is nothing God cannot do. That is not even my focus this morning. I just share that story to tell you that there are times in life when you need crazy faith. And God is a rewarder of men that walk by faith. There is no one in the Bible that I know that held on to God and had faith in God in times of crisis that God disappointed. No one in the Bible. All the great people will tell their stories. I will get there very shortly. There is a reward for having uncommon faith in God in the time of crisis. Faith is in degree, like I explained before, there is the gift of faith. The faith that every Christian has in God is different from the gift of faith. So when you see people just make, they make generic assumptions. Every believer is the same. Everybody has the same grace. Everyone has the same anointing. Of course, I know that people who say certain things, they don't read the scriptures. We are equal in Christ. We have equal access to Christ, but we have different results. Our results are based on our gifts. Our results are based on our sacrifices. Our results are based on how hard working we have. So two people can be born again the same day. They have access to the same Holy Spirit. They have access to the same God. Ten years after, one has grown more mature than the other one. We are not operating at the same level of faith. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 8 and 9, Apostle Paul highlights the gift of the Spirit. And there are nine of them. There is the revelation gift, that is word of wisdom, word of knowledge, and designing of spirit. There is the power gift, that is the gift of miracles. Gift of special faith. And gift of healings, in plural. Healings. So gift of faith or special faith, working of miracles and healings. That is, these three are categorized under, under the power gift. Then we have the utterance gift. That is the gift of prophecy. That is the gift of interpretation of tongues. And that is the gift of diverse kinds of tongues. There are none of them. So 
the faith that a believer has in God, you are trusting about something, is available to everyone. If every Christian reads the Bible and you pick up a verse, you can latch on that verse, believe God for what you are trusting God for, and God will answer your prayer. But there is a higher level of faith provoked by the gift of special faith. It is a supernatural empowerment of the Holy Spirit that bestows the capacity to believe God for dangerous things. You believe God for things that are crazy. Because you are being inspired by the Holy Spirit to believe God for that. I know a pastor, he's a friend of mine, who went to an embassy. An embassy of a country. He had no passport. He had no document. And he said, I want to go to this country. I won't mention his name because he may be watching me now. <laughs> Let's take for example, he mentioned one of the developed countries in the world, like the UK. I want to imagine you going to the UK embassy now. And... I want to go to the UK. Say for what? Where is your invitation? You have an account statement. You have a passport. Yes. You have a, 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 a hotel. You have booked. Yes. For what purpose? God has sent me to the UK. Okay, okay. Go and apply online. I can't apply. I have to get to the UK tomorrow morning. Ah. So they were just laughing at him. And the man stood there before the gate of the embassy. Okay, you want to apply for visa? Go and do it properly. He said no. God has asked me to go to the UK. I'm a missionary. I'm going there next week. Oh, sorry, I'm going there tomorrow. I have to be there tomorrow to preach. No happened. They took his passport and gave him a permit without any documentation. He told me personally, and I believe him because I know the, this man is a very dangerous man. Very dangerous man. He operates some crazy level of faith. And he will tell you, God has told me. <laughs> and let me tell you the story of a man. This pastor is in Nigeria. One day, this pastor told God, I am a Muslim. I got converted as a Muslim. When I was a Muslim, I used to have a lot of clothes. I used to have cars to drive. Now that I'm a Christian, I am wearing rags. And it was true. This guy was wearing rags. He will wear only one shirt and trousers for a whole month. When the, when the shirt is dirty, after like a week or two weeks, he will go to a remote place. Where there's a river, he will remove the shirt and the trouser, leaving him alone with, the, with his underwears. He will wash it beside the river and put it, lay it out for the sun to dry it. <laughs> One day he said, he laid out the clothes and he just slept under a tree. He didn't know that the cows, cows were passing. Cows were passing. So, <laughs> the cows just went where his clothes were laid. And... They passed out urine and whatever on the shirt. When the man woke up, he saw the shirt he had washed with cow dung on it. He was mad. He said, he and then the soap that he used, he had run out of soap. So he took that shirt and used water alone in the river to wash it. And then he dried it again. How? <laughs> if you wash a cloth that cow dung has been dumped on, with ordinary water. Do you think you have washed that cloth? So he said after the clothes are dry, he wore the shirt. And then it was evening fellowship in church. So he went to church in the evening. <laughs> when he saw, he said he stood in between the members of the church. People are saying, what's happening here? He said he himself was saying, what's happening here? What's happening here? He said the old church, it was a small church. Because the shirt he was wearing was, was full of remnant of of cow dung <laughs> the perfume on it was cow dung that was how terribly poor this man was so when he said to god one day he said god i will quit christianity this man is not when you hear him the man sometimes say, oh, what kind of a human being is this there are some people because of their level of relationship with god when they talk to god they talk to god like their friend he said he was saying thank god when i was a muslim i had shirts i had trousers I am a Christian now. I am wearing clothes that are torn. I don't have a job. I don't have money. God, I need clothes. Oh. He said, God said, eh, go and go and get clothes now. He said, I would like get clothes. I don't have money. God said, okay, go to any store you like. That you what I'm saying, you think it's not possible. The level of encounter you have with God 
is determined by the sacrifices and prices you you are willing to pay. There are people who pay huge sacrifices in prayer, in fasting, and they wait on God. They will be hearing God speaking to them. They will, they will hear God speak to them in dream. He will speak to them through the world. Sometimes he will send angels to them. I was telling my wife this morning of the story of Tereki again. Jesus will walk to his room face to face, not in the dream. Because this man will spend eight hours praying in tongues in the spirit every day. He prayed himself into an encounter. <laughs> so when you say something can never happen, you better wait and let me tell you stories of people that it has happened to. This man left his house and went to a big shop in the part of Lagos, Nigeria. A big shop where they were selling clothes. When he got there, he started looking at all the beautiful shirts. He was telling the owner of the shop, I want this. I want this. Ah. When they saw him point to three, four expensive shirts, the owner of the shop called the, the um, uh, one of his, uh, his helpers in the shop and said, go and buy Coke for our customer. We have a big customer today. This man didn't have any money. <laughs> I want this. When he picked all the trousers, the, a box of clothes was full. This, the, the owner of the shop was dancing. I heard this story from this man directly now. I didn't read it in the paper or on the internet. He said in his heart, he was saying, ah, God, if you disgrace me today, this, I'm leaving Jesus today. But this man had the spirit of faith. He was not operating under ordinary faith. Oh, this faith is not ordinary faith. So after he had picked all the clothes, he told the shop owner that give me two minutes. I want to make a call outside. So he went outside and I think he brought out his phone. He just pretended and said, God, I have picked the clothes. Where is the money? God said, ah, go back inside now and talk to that man. Tell that shop owner that I sent you to him that he should give you that clothes. The man said, eh? Go and tell that shop owner that I, God, I sent you to him. He should give you the clothes. The man started laughing. Say, they will, this is not uh, my, these are uh, my fellow evil brothers. They will beat me. The man just said, yes. The, the spirit of faith is the anointing of faith on him now. He went inside the shop and he said, <clears throat> actually, God sent me here. My name is Susan So. And he asked me to come and choose all the clothes I want. You know what? Before he finished speaking, the shop owner started shouting, Hey, come and see your oh, CBC trouble. He called all the other shop owners and they gathered. He said, Come on here. I have never had this kind of thing in my life. Oga, can you repeat yourself again? Say, My name is Brother So and So. I came from this place. I'm a Christian. I'm a child of God. I need clothes. And uh, God told me to come to your shop. <laughs> the shop owner said, so out of all the shop in this city, you do you travel for like three, four hours to my shop. You didn't stop in shop A. You didn't go to shop C. It's my own shop you have come to. I will beat you today. Hey, I, the other shop owners who came together, they said, wait, 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 wait. Somebody traveled down four or five hours from a city to your shop. And he said, God sent him. Hmm. Maybe God sent him, you know, hey, let's be careful. <laughs> let's be careful so that God will not fight us. The shop owner said, will you carry all these clothes and get out of my shop, please? <laughs> this guy carried all the clothes. I said, thank you, thank you. I went. When I heard this story, I said, God. Now, does it mean that everybody should be going to people's shops and say, you go to TM Lou in London or you go to HM A's and Curtis? I and you no, at that time, that man could have been the only one in the whole world that God was speaking to for that. If I begin to tell you stories about what God has done in this man's life, the man is still alive now. Strange things you will not believe. Strange things. Because that is what the spirit of faith, sorry, the gift of faith does. The gift of faith. It is not the kind of faith you and I have normally. That faith is available to everyone. You can believe God for anything, and then if it is back, back up by the word, God will answer your prayer. As when you are, if you are patient enough to wait on God, there are some people they get instant, sometimes audible instruction from God. Some not all the time now. Sometimes they get audible instruction. Sometimes it's an open vision, and God will give them instruction. Arise, go to London, 
by next week. And or an angel appears to them. As long as what they are doing doesn't contradict scriptures, don't fight them. Don't oppose them. So this story of a general who prayed and prayed and prayed and suddenly they found a spring of water in the desert. That was the product of faith. And it is not easy to have faith in God in the time of difficulty. Let me give, give us some examples. How easy do you think it is when after 10 years of marriage, there is no baby and someone is telling you there is a prophet somewhere who can help you get a baby. You just have to do this thing, do this thing, sleep in the on the bar beach or sleep on an ocean in I mean beside an ocean or go and take your bath somewhere and then you have a twist. You don't want to hear what people are doing when they are in crisis. When you now tell that woman who is 45 years old to have faith in God, how easy do you think it is for him to have faith at 45? Particularly an African woman under the pressure of families and illness. When after 15 years of waiting on God for a job, you are a graduate, you are waiting for a job, waiting for a job, and it is 15 years after your graduation, and nothing has happened, and someone is telling you to do a project with him, just change the figures, just do something, and you're going to make 10 million naira or 5 million dollars, and no one will know. And someone is telling you, have faith in God. Don't go that route. You think the flesh can pursue God's or that is God's option, the flesh will want to pursue the other option. That is why I say that having faith in a time of difficulty is very difficult. You need to be rooted in God. I will get to that very shortly. When after many years of applying for a visa, you want to travel, God is telling you, you have to leave this country or go to another country and you apply, they are refusing you, refusing you, refusing you. But someone is telling you, I have faith in God. Another person is telling you, I can help you out. I'll just cut the picture of a French passport. <laughs> ah, Nigerians, may God have mercy on us. I have the story of a lady. This lady is living in London. London, United Kingdom. And she's a British citizen. She has a prophet in Nigeria. That prophet was a spiritual father so anytime she has problem she will call the man in nigeria so one day she called the man and told the man that she's tired of living in england there's no job she's just on the same spot the nigerian prophet said she should come back home your blessing is in nigeria and he manipulated her and she came back home when she came back home the prophet said bring your passport your british passport bring it to me to keep for you let me keep it for you and I will perform some prayers on them so that you can prosper in Nigeria. God says the Lord, if you hold that passport in your hand, that passport will block you from prospering in Nigeria. So the lady quickly went to Nigeria, packed her back from Britain and gave the passport to the prophet in Nigeria. And she started working and settling down in Nigeria. She was in Nigeria for years. <laughs> no happened. Anytime that lady, that lady sleeps, she'll be having attacks in her dream. To cut the long story short, you know that prophet gave that passport to another woman and sold the passport. And that other woman used that passport to go to London. <laughs> the owner of the passport, the original one, is in Nigeria. The fake one is now in England using the passport to work. Sending money to the prophet every month, sending tithe, tithe, offering, tithe, and offering. And the other one was in Nigeria. So, the other one in Nigeria, at a time in her life, she began to go through crisis, problem, crisis, problem, crisis, problem. Ah, she will be having attacks in her dream and she began to pray. So, I think she met another pastor who now took her through some sessions of intense prayer. And God gave a revelation. That was how the secret was exposed. <sighs> there is reward for having faith in God. I look at the Bible. 
Look at Abraham. Look at Joseph. Look at Daniel. Look at Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Look at Moses. Look at David. Look at Paul and our Lord Jesus. All of them had faith and trust in God in difficult situations. There was no time in their lives that they trusted God for something and they were in a pleasurable environment. 25 years, Abraham was waiting for a child. 25 years. Joseph waited for 13 years to have that dream. He kept having faith in God. My dream. He had alternatives. Potiphar's wife tried to lure, lure him. Maybe the wife would have tempted Joseph. Come and sleep with me. I will kill my husband. And then you will become the new Potiphar. That would have been an alternative. But Joseph held on. Shadrach, Meshach, Meshach and Abednego, they held on. Moses held on. God called Moses when he was 80, age 80. He was saying no. He was, because he knew God was giving him a very difficult assignment. How can God tell you to go and deliver people from the same man that you yourself ran away from? Moses ran away from Egypt because Pharaoh wanted to kill him. God is now sending him back to go to the same place. It was a difficult situation, but he had faith in God. You and I know how God rewarded Moses. Let me tell us some factors that make it difficult for us as believers to sustain our faith in the time of difficulty. We are living in a world that is under intense pressure. The church is under intense pressure. Believers are shaken. Their faith is shaken. All kinds of things are tearing through the resolve of Christians to stick with God because we are in a falling world that is trying to hijack the faith of Christians. We have a lot of alternatives. I call them corrupt alternatives to problems. If you need a child, you don't have to wait on God. There are many things people do not to get a child. I am not speaking about the medical, the, 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 the medical uh, options now. I'm speaking about the occultic things people do to get children. If you need money, you don't have to wait on God. There are things people do to stimulate wealth oh, using occultic powers. And a lot of Christians, including pastors, are doing it. <laughs> I'll just run through this before because of my time. If you are in the midst of wrong set of friends, that is why I always emphasize relationship. I anytime I'm preaching about this issue, I mention relationship. Make sure you put people that will build your faith around you. The people I, I talk to regularly, two, three, four people. I don't have crowds of friends, pastors, two, three people. Every one of them strengthens my faith. I strengthen their faith too. So if you surround yourself with weaklings, doubters, people who will tell you it cannot work, people will tell you all the reasons in the world why people who have done that thing will fail, you will not have faith. Uh, because you will be only as strong as the people that surround you. So pressure from friends, particularly ministers, don't surround yourself with bad, bad friends. Pastors that started ministry three years ago and they have bought three houses. They have bought 10 cars. Pastors that started ministry two years ago and they have captured all the TV stations in the world. And they will tell you God has done it. And they will choose the scripture. God can do anything. God can turn a man to a billionaire in 24 hours. That is true. God can do it. But God doesn't do it. God is a God of process. There is not one single person that God will raise in the Bible to become great. They are not pass through process. Not one. Measure one for me. Every great man in the Bible, Daniel, Moses, Abraham, Joseph, even our Lord Jesus, he was trained for 30 years to do a ministry of three years. Paul was trained in, in, in Jerusalem for three years. And he did not write two-thirds of the Bible, of the New Testament, in three years. It was after 
years after he was in ministry, years that he started writing letters, letters, letters. It wasn't after he got born again, he began to write letters. So be careful of friends. So pressure from friends can weaken your faith. Collapsed societal values and culture of impatience. When you live in a society, for example, in a place like some countries in Africa, Nigeria, or Ghana, Uganda, some of those societies have endemic culture of impatience. The songs that the young people listen to on the radio, all those songs, I want to hammer, I want to blow, I want to hammer, you go hammer, <laughs> you will blow. <laughs> I pity the new generation. Oh my God. During our own time, everything in my head was mathematics. How to be the best scientist. How to copy so 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 and so person who is the best physicist. How to be the best engineer. We competed on intellectualism. We are competing. If we weren't competing on how many books you have read, how many Christian books you have read, we competed on intellectualism. Who is the best mathematician in our school? I will be the best next year. I will be, and we had no time. Even the things we were hearing on radio were promoting patience, were promoting the right values, not in this generation. So you are hearing music in the radio telling you you will hammer, you will hammer, you will blow, you will hammer, you will blow. See me, I don't blow. After three months, after two weeks, I don't blow, I don't have a, And then you are preaching to that person. Have faith in God. Wait for your own time. God will do it. You, you will just be like a comedian to them. So the young people are trooping towards bad influencers because the societal values are collapsing. Now, not just in Africa, even though it is worse in Africa. In America too, they have their own bad values too. In the developed world, they have their own bad values. They are not just as horrific as our home in Africa. So you won't have faith, though. You can't have faith at all. And then the climbing messages and teachings in the church that don't promote patience and endurance, which is what is, this is what makes pastors to be culpable now. So when you as a pastor, the overarching teachings that you bring to the people they are always focusing on 24 hours turn around turn around there is nothing wrong about turn around but it is unscriptural to tell people that is in every situation of their life they will experience 24 hours turn around god does not give people 24 hours turn around in every situation you want to be the greatest engineer 24 hour turn around. You know how many years, by the grace of God, it has taken me to do some of the little things I'm doing. Go and pick anybody who is excelling in the world of medicine. Pick anyone randomly in the world who is a star in the world of pharmacy. They will tell you they have invested 25 years, 20 years. They went to university for seven years. They did housemanship for one year. They trained as a junior pharmacology or pharmacist for three years. Before the guy got to a point where he's the MD of Glaxo, Smith Klein Beecham, one of the biggest pharmaceutical companies in the world. He didn't start, he wasn't 24 hours turn around. So when you are preaching that, you are not emphasizing the value and culture of patience, of endurance, of process, of preparation. You are tingling the ears of young people. They will think that they will just snap their hands and get it. Snap their hands and get it. And life is not built on that kind of a faulty foundation. So many of them will do what you want them to do and they won't get that result. They will not go and look for something else to make them get that result so you won't be able to build young men and women whose faith is rooted in god if you are promoting 24 hour miracle 24 hour, there will be times when god wants to turn people around in 24 hours that will be a one-off revelation that will be your personal revelation for that time you won't make it a corporate doctrine and you begin to preach it and teach it and anywhere you go i know a pastor who does that anywhere he goes anywhere he preaches 24 hour 
24 hours, 12 hours, 7 hours, in 3 hours, and everybody has to show a seed, 24 And out of 10,000 people in the church who saw that seed, only 50, 20, 10 come back with the testimony. So the remaining 9,980, God has put them on, on the waiting list. Because truth is truth if it is universal. If it only works for me and not for others, it is not a truth. It is a lie. That is why salvation, which is driven by if any man will confess in his acts and believe with the and confess with his mouth and believe in his heart that Jesus Christ, God has raised him, he shall be saved. Anywhere you preach that message, in America, in Armenia, in Mexico, in Nigeria, in Togo, it is the truth. It will produce the same effects. Lack of spiritual growth and mental development to manage pressure will suck your faith. You will only grow, you will only develop capacity for faith based on your spiritual growth. The more of God's word you have, the more access you have to God, your, sorry, the more access to have to revelations, to encounters, the more you fast and pray, the more time you spend in the study of the world, all of those things put together will strengthen your faith. When challenges come in life and you are in the midst of zero, there is nothing to even lean on. You will be able to trust God. I believe God. People are telling you, you are at the verge of destruction. Say, no, I can't be destroyed. Why? Because you are strong inside, internally. You have built capacity over the years. That is the reason why a lot of false pastors, they find it easy to deceive people because you are talking to people that are weak spiritually. They are very weak. So when you tell them to do anything, they will do it. They will do it because they want solution to their problem. So when you are strong spiritually and you're going to a pastor and he's asking you to do things that are unscriptural, you pick the signal immediately. Say, no, I can't do this. No, I can't do it. And people around you will be telling you, you have no option. Say, no, I have an option. <laughs> Let the worst happen. I cannot do this. I can't sleep with my boss. I'm a believer in Christ. If you don't sleep with him, this is the last opportunity for you to get a promotion. I don't care to be on the same level. No, no problem. I can't do it. <laughs> because your faith is rooted in God that even if your boss doesn't promote you, God will promote you. It may not be today, but we do it. Weakened marriage institution. Weakened marriage institution. Now, when the wife is putting pressure on the husband to do things that are against God's will, and the husband is also putting pressure on the wife. I know cases where husbands sometimes tell their wives to sleep with their bosses to get promotion. If you know if you, some of the things that pastors hear, there are some things that I hear sometimes. I just say, what, what is this? The, the, the senior brother will connive with the junior brother and ask his junior brother to sleep with his wife because the wife has not been able to produce because the husband has a low spam count. So the husband will not tell his brother, can you help me please sleep with my junior sister, sorry, with my wife. And it will be a secret among the three of us. Weakened marriage, weakened marriage institution can also suck faith out of people. So the ability to trust God, to depend on God, to have a faith that is unshakable in God can be militated against if you have a bad wife or a bad husband who has terrible values and is pushing you. We must make money. Look at our mates. Look at your friend. They have bought a house. This is their third house. They are all going for vacation. They went to Hawaii last week. Last year, they went to some city in America. They went to this. What have you been doing? I can't stand this any longer. You have to do something. I need a Range Rover Sports. I need a Tesla for my 40th birthday. You have to do it for me. And the money say, I cannot afford it. Wait. No, no. I will make this house very miserable for you. I, there are Christian ladies doing that. And if I tell you some things the Christian men are doing too, putting their wife under pressure, pressurizing her, pressurizing her, and pushing the woman, and pushing her, 
and pushing her until the woman goes out of the house to do what she should not do. And the woman, the, the man will now, will now look sober after crisis has collapsed on the family. So all of these things will make faith development very, very difficult. But despite all these factors, a believer in Christ should never trade his faith in God for any evil alternative. When you keep knocking a door that God is not opening, this thing you are asking, you know it's not good. And you are knocking that door, praying, 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 knocking, praying, praying. Satan will hijack it and you will get an answer. You will think God is the one answering your prayer, but it's Satan. That is called passive witchcraft. Passive witchcraft is for you to keep knocking a door that God has not opened. And you force that door to be opened, not knowing that Satan is behind the opening of that door. Which explains the reason why when some pastors are doing what is wrong and they're getting results, and who are saying, if, they, if it is not God that is doing it, then who is doing it? Oh no, <laughs> that person is ignorant. Most things that God does, mark that word, most things that God does, Satan creates alternatives. God gives children, Satan gives children. God gives wealth, Satan gives wealth. God opens doors, Satan opens doors. God gives favor, Satan gives favor. There are people when they appear, everybody loves them. God can do that, Satan can do it. There are things people do that the whole world will be liking them. They will be giving them favor. <laughs> So you don't use results to validate, sorry, you don't use results to validate divine approval, to test, oh, if he's getting results, that means God is working with him. Not in this dispensation. God is a rewarder of those whose faith is rooted in him. If you don't develop your faith, no one will develop it for you. I have told us of the story of John Wesley. John Wesley, in, the, in 1736, in the 17th century, he was on a ship with some Germans, a German group of Christians. They were in a ship, they were traveling to a particular place, and the ship was rocking. In the midst of the ocean, there was a mighty storm. The ship was rocking left, right. And John Wesley wasn't a, wasn't a believer at that time. He was so afraid. He was so afraid. And then in the midst of that fear, he was panicking. He had a music like people were singing. What is going on here? And he tried to locate the source of the music. He discovered it was the group of Christians, German Christians who were singing. He said they did not miss, they didn't miss the rhythm. The one you are singing, that's the rhythm. They didn't miss the rhythm of their song. Singing praise worship, the boat was turning, they were shaking. John Wesley went to the leader of the team. He said, Are you not afraid? The man said, No. Are your women not afraid? The man said, No. Are your men not afraid? The man said, No. Ah, that was the turning point in John Wesley's life. John Wesley came out of that boat shortly after that time, he gave his life to Christ. He said, Their faith provoked him. Their faith provoked him. What are the things that drive faith? Before I go into that, as I'm rounding up, as I'm rounding up, you are having faith in God. You are believing him for something. Don't throw away your faith. Don't yield to, don't compromise your faith. Don't yield to any satanic or evil alternatives. Abraham sustained his faith in God. You know what became of Abraham? Abraham became the father of faith. Up till tomorrow, Abraham still holds a place in the kingdom of God. God rewards people of faith. Joseph held on to God. What happened to Joseph? He became a prime minister. Daniel held on to God. Despite every opportunity for him to corrupt himself, his faith in God remained unshakable. 
Daniel was the only one in the Bible that survived 13 kings, four empires and 13 kings. Every king was using him as part of their staffs. Nebuchadnezzar used him. Belteshazzar used him. Cyrus used him. They were all using him. Sorry, Darius. Using him. And he survived 13 kings. At the end of the day, God gave Daniel the greatest vision and prophetic vision of the end time. That after the Lord Jesus, he was the only one that had that encounter. He prophesied not just for now, not just for time, but for eternity. His prophecy reached to the days of the Antichrist. Daniel chapter 9 verse 27. Chapter, chapter 8. Daniel spoke of times to come. That is what faith does. David held on to God. And in 13 years of waiting on God by faith, he became the king eventually. And he raised up a son, Solomon. And we all know that the Lord Jesus came directly from the lineage of David. God honors faith. Faith honors God. Paul held on to God unshakably. Paul was in the prison when he was writing the letters. So when Paul was saying, I labored more than they all. He was laboring, not under air conditioning. Paul was inside the prison. The prison of those days are not American prison, British prisons. The Middle Eastern prison, according to Bible scholars, were like four feet, 4.5 feet tall. Middle Eastern prison in those days. So when you are in the prison and you are six feet or five feet tall, mean that you have to bend yourself to fit that cage. And they will put chain on your hand. Sometimes they will put chain on your leg. And he was writing with stylus on papyrus. He wasn't writing with our pen. The pen they used in those days was called stylus, metal pen. And they wrote on leather. How easy do you think it is to write on leather? Just pick a leather and write with with get like a knife or something and try to write on it. I labored more than they all. <laughs> By the time God was done with Paul, God gave him the honor of writing more than two thirds of the New Testament. Faith in God. Faith in God. Let me tell you the things that will drive your faith. I don't want anything to have affect my faith in this dispensation. The world is sitting on a time bomb. We have not seen anything though. Jesus said that these things are the beginning of sorrows. All the crises rocking the whole world. You think you can pray them away? Never. Read Matthew 24. Jesus said they must come to pass. Because they are the signs of the end time. So, you and I have no alternative other than to build our faith in God and remain permanently glued to Christ. There is no way. I have not known any year since I've been born that people have been dying in a year, like year 2020. On a monthly basis, apart from Corona, when you open Facebook, people are Obituary, 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 obituary. People will be healthy today. Tomorrow morning, they fall sick. Next day, they are dead. The, the, we have entered a new era completely. So there is no better time to be connected to God and be rooted in faith than now. And God will reward that faith. So you have to be deeply committed to knowing God through his word. How will you have faith in someone you don't know his words? You can only trust somebody because you know something about him. Think about it in the natural. How will a wife trust her husband when the husband is keeping secret? When your husband is open to you, you have access to his phone, you have access to his account, you know how much he has. Anything he tells you, you're going to believe it. But when you are keeping secret from your wife, or you are a wife, you are keeping secret from your husband. The man will not trust you. So, the reason why many Christians are finding it hard to trust God is because they don't have access to his word. Their word bank is dried up. There is no money. Sorry, there is no, no, nothing in their word bank. It's like a bank where you keep money. It is empty. 
So you will naturally not trust him. When you, when you are having challenges and you need to trust him, God will not disappoint me. You will not be able to trust him. Maybe, let me have a backup plan. Maybe we fail. Let me, let me think of something. Build your faith in God by soaking yourself in his word. Walking by faith in little, little issues of life will help you to walk by faith in big, big, big issues. Little, little issue. Little, little issue. Trust God. Now, some people, it is when they want to apply for a job that they trust God. I want favor. I want favor. But when they want to get married, they do it with their own power. They choose whoever they want. Now, you separate your marriage from God. You separate the raising of your children from God. But when you need, you have an issue with the courts, you have a court case, then you remember God. That is when, ah, I need God's favor. No, it won't work. If you find it hard to trust God with the choice of a life partner, you find it hard to trust God with wisdom to raise your children, and you do those things in your own natural strength, using the world's approach, you want to get a good wife, you go to a dating website, you pick a woman, you don't want to care whether she's a, she's a believer or not, whether she's an Hindu or Buddhist, you don't care. She's a beautiful woman, she has to go ahead. That is your own definition of a wife. And then you bring her home. And three months after the marriage, crisis breaks out. She doesn't want to pray. She's smoking in the house. She's, uh, she's, uh, she's, she's chanting incantation. I saw, a, I saw a cowrie in her bag. I saw her in my dream. She wanted to stab me in my dream. Because you went after the children of the devil. And when you married the daughter of Satan, Satan will become your father-in-law. It is natural and normal. And when the father-in-law has given a daughter to a man, you cannot stop your father-in-law from visiting you. From time to time, he wants to visit and check on his daughter. That is the situation with so many people. So you shut God out of some issues. When you now have a big problem, you now want to go. It won't work because you wouldn't have developed the capacity to trust God in that bigger issue. Because the other issues of your life, you, you cut God away from them. That is why the Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of God. The most important word in that verse is the word first. He didn't say seek ye the kingdom of God. No. He didn't tell us to seek God anyhow. You got to make him first. When you make him first in your marriage, you make him first in your home, you make him first in your finance, you make him first in your career. When you have problem with a court, you would have developed capacity over the years because you have always been living on God in all other areas of life. So to trust God to help you solve that problem in a court will be very easy. You will be able to have faith in him. Another thing that builds faith is to develop a strong prayer altar. If you don't pray, you will never be able to have faith. Faith is of the spirit, and that is where great things happen. According to Kenneth E. again, faith is not natural. Faith is not belief. If you go to the, the, the dictionary and type the word belief, they will tell you belief is to have confidence. That is not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a spiritual entity. That is the raw material for my salvation and your salvation. Faith. It is a spiritual entity. And it can only be developed and groomed and sustained on the platform of spirituality. So when you are not prayerful, you don't pray as a Christian. You cannot have faith. Think about it. When you are praying, you are communicating with a superior being, with God. How do you want to pray? Sorry, how do you want to have faith in someone that you don't communicate with? You don't talk to him. No relationship, no solitude. You've never fasted in your life. You can't barely pray for five minutes, but you can spend 18 hours on Instagram. And then you are having a crisis, and then somebody is telling you, go and pray. No. You won't be able to pray because you can only talk to someone that you believe and have faith in. And then when you turn it around, you can only have faith in someone that you talk to. If you have a problem now, for example, can you just call someone on the road and say, hello, please, can you help me solve this problem? Somebody you don't know. No. 
It must be somebody you know, your friend, you talk to him every day or every week, and you have a relationship with him. That is the kind of person you want to share your problem with. So, a prayerless Christian is a faithless Christian. You will never be able to have faith. And if there is no faith in you, you cannot please God. The Bible says, without faith, it is impossible. Not that it is likely. It is eternally impossible to please God. That's the scripture. Marry the right person. If you are here and you have a brother, you have a sister, you have a young person who is trusting God for married partner. Marriage comes with turbulences, troubles, and trials. You need a spouse that will strengthen your faith, not a spouse that will puncture your faith. There are people, when you marry them, and you're at 95% in faith, your faith will fizzle down to 10%. Because that man will water down everything spiritual in your life. Praise the Lord. I have told us the story of this man many times. This man is called Adoniram Judson. Adoniram. God sent Adoniram to the nation of Burma. The nation of Burma, Burma is predominantly Islamic. And he went there to preach the gospel. The government of Burma arrested Adoniram. And they, are, they are, are accused him of espionage. Espionage. That you have come to spy on our land. I am a missionary. They didn't believe him. That is a decoy. That is a decoy. You actually have a plan to spy on us. They arrested Adoniram Johnson and they imprisoned him. They hung him upside down. They hung, sorry, they hung him upside down when they saw that he was going to die quickly. They now hanged him right side up and they hanged him on his tongue. Hey, they tied a rope, a chain on his tongue. Do you know what it means to hang the full weight of a man's body on his tongue? All the bone of the tongue will just break because once your body is sustained on your tongue, it breaks the bone. The man was dying. He refused to, to deny Christ. When they saw that he was, he was going to die, they removed the chain. They now dumped him in a cell. <laughs> And the man was there. They didn't feed him very well. They tortured him. And this man was married and he had a child. In the dead of the night, the wife would crawl to the prison. How she did it, nobody knew. And we knock the roof, the window of the prison. I will say to him, Adonira, hang on. Hang on, Adonira. God will soon give us the victory and she will crawl back to her house. The second day at night, she will crawl, 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 knock the window of the prison. Hadonira, Hadonira, hang on, Adonira. God will soon give us the victory. The faith of Adonira, my husband, was strengthened. He said that was what was strengthening him. He was in pain, he was under torture. The fourth day, weeks, weeks, and weeks. One day, she did not come. The name of the woman was Han. Han did not come. Adonira was, was, was surprised. Ah, well, maybe something happened. Second day, Han didn't show up. Third day, first week, second week, and Adoniram slipped back into depression. Oh my God, my wife has abandoned me. But his faith arose in him again. A couple of years, one year, two years, whatever, Adoniram was released. His body was battered. He was scattered. He was wounded. Sores all over his body. He was staggering home, crawling. And when he approached his old house, he saw a huge dump of refuse, a rough refuse dump. And he saw his, he saw a baby in that refuse dump. A baby, a little child. What is going on here? By the time he approached, he, that little child was his own daughter that he left with his wife about a year or two because he spent like a year or two in prison. The, the, the baby was dying, he was, but God sustained that little girl, but he was eating from the dump. Adoniram grabbed that baby, that little girl, skinny, and she was, and he crawled 
to the earth, their earth. The earth was smelling and he was searching for his wife. And he saw an image on a wooden bed. It was like a bag of bones. Adoniram crawled. And by the time he moved closer, it was Han. Han had been sick. That was the reason Han did not come again to the prison to encourage Adoniram. She had been falling sick, falling sick, falling sick, falling sick. But this time, she had fallen sick irrecoverably. And she was shrinking. She was drying up. Adoniram began to cry. Han, Han, my dear wife. Han, my dear wife. I'm, quote, I'm quoting this verbatim now. Oh, Han, oh, Han, Han, my dear wife. And the wife summoned up her last courage. As soon as the tears on the eyes of Adoniram touched the body of the wife, she summoned her last courage and whispered to her husband, and whispered, and she said, hang on, Adoniram, hang on. God will give us the victory. And she passed on. Adoniram broke down and began to weep. He carried a baby, a daughter on her hand, and bent over the corpse of the, of the wife. And she he wept and wept. Oh, Han, my dear wife. Oh, Han, Han. He cried, cried, cried. He carried the corpse of the wife, carried the corpse to a particular place, dug the grave, and buried the woman. And he made up his mind that he will preach the gospel in the nation of Burma. And we ensure that there is revival in the land. And he summoned up courage, Adoniram, to train his only daughter. And Adoniram began to preach again, began to preach again, and began to win souls for Christ, win souls for Christ. And churches began to rise, began to rise, began to plant churches, elderly churches, elderly churches, and thousands of citizens of the nation of Burma gave their life to Christ under the ministry of Adoniram Judson. If you go to Google today and you type the name of Adoniram Judson, is regarded in the nation of Burma in the in Asia as one of the greatest and most impactful evangelists and missionaries that God sent to the Muslim nation of Burma, and he brought revival to that land. How was he able to do all of this great feat? Faith in God. Faith in God. No one has faith in God and God abandons them. I want to encourage you, my sisters and my brothers. Do not let anyone puncture your faith. Do not cast away your confidence, which has a great recompense of reward. There is no one on earth who doesn't have challenge. There is no one on earth who doesn't have issues. But the God of heaven, he has promised us. Jesus said, my peace I leave unto you, not as the world gives. He said, in this world you will have tribulation. These things have I spoken unto you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. You are listening to me, you look around your life. You can hardly point to anything that is significant as a success. You can hardly see anything that is pleasurable. It's like battles, battles, problems, stress, headache, depression, maritally, financially, everything is rocking. Do not cast away your confidence. You may actually be passing through God's training school. You may actually be passing through God's preparatory school. When Joseph was inside the prison, God sent two people to him, the baker and the butler. And Joseph could have done what you and I would have done. Joseph would have told them, I don't believe in dreams. Dreams don't come true. Remember those two guys had dreams and they came to Joseph. Joseph also had dreams. He would have told them, even me myself, I had a dream. I had a dream. Look at where my dream has landed me. I don't believe in dreams. Dreams don't work. If Joseph had done that, that was the greatest test. Joseph had been tested by God, tested over the years. That was the 11th year of Joseph testing. Joseph didn't know that God allocated 13 years of testing for him. He had passed the state of 11 years. So he was on his 11th year in the prison and 
two years after that incident in the prison was when the other guy remembered him. So Joseph had spent like 85 to 90 percent of his training school, of his training time. If he had told those two guys, I don't believe in dreams. Don't talk about dreams to me. Go and sleep in your own cell. Leave me alone. What would have happened would have happened. One of them would have been killed by Potiphar, by, 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 by Pharaoh. The other would have been reinstated. That one that was reinstated was the one that remembered Joseph in the prison. He would not have mentioned Joseph to Pharaoh that a man interpreted my dream and Joseph would have died as a prisoner. Died unknown, unsung, uncelebrated. That is what happens when Satan shoots an arrow to people's faith and he kills their faith and they give up on God. When they give up on God, God cannot do anything because without faith, it is impossible to please him. And God has sent me to someone here today, don't give up on God. If you have a friend that is shooting arrow, shooting a dagger to your faith, he is always telling you it cannot work. It will not work. You have to run from such a person. Find a replacement. Look for faith builders. Look for faith, faith boosters. Look for faith enlargers. Look for faith expanders. Read books that will boost your faith. Books of people who have done what you have not done. You want to be a great philanthropist. You want to feed the whole of America. Go and buy books of people who have fed the whole of North America. People who have fed Africa. Who are believers. Who are God-fearing people. And read their books. And you will have the capacity to believe. Ah, if God can do it for, for that man. And he fed the whole continent. My own is just a, a, just a whole city. God will do it for me. Spend time in the world. Spend time in prayer. And surround yourself with godly, godly, godly friends and faith building friends. If you are not married or you have a friend, you have a brother, a sister who is about to get married, encourage them to marry people who will not puncture their faith. People who are believers, people who are Christians, who love Jesus. It will matter very soon. It will matter one day. A day is coming, challenges will come. You need someone to pump your faith. You don't want someone to add more problem to you on the day of challenge. And you'll be speaking down on your faith, talking down on your confidence. And this is the word God has put in my heart today. If it has been of a blessing to you, I want us to return all the glory and honor to God. It is his word, it is not my word. If you are listening to me and you are not born again, I want to invite you to Jesus today. I want to give you the greatest investment platform. There is no other investment platform greater than giving your life to Jesus. Oil and gas, stocks and shares, diamond and gold, Bitcoin and whatever coin exists in the world. All of them are part and parcel of the world that is fading away. For we brought nothing into this world and it is certain we're taking nothing out. Billionaires are dying. People that have money, that have oil fields, that have diamond fields, they are dying. The only thing that will follow them is what they have done with Jesus. You will get a return on that investment. If you invest in Jesus, you will get a return. In fact, you will get two returns. Let me tell you the two returns you will get. You will get the gift of righteousness. God will wipe away your past and will kill the sin nature in you. And we bestow upon you the righteousness of Jesus, which no amount of money in this world can buy. And then you will get the gift of eternal life. The gift of eternal life. And eternal life starts from now, not just when you get to heaven. I want you to say these words after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I know that I am a sinner and I need a savior. I know that I don't have a relationship with you. I am just religious. I want you to come into my heart. Come and forgive me all of my sins. Come and be my Lord and my Savior. I accept you into my heart today as my personal Lord and Savior. Accept me into your kingdom. Give me the gift of your righteousness. Write my name in your book of life. Thank you, Jesus. In Jesus glorious and matchless name we have prayed if you have said those words truthfully and faithfully you are now born again and you are a member of god's kingdom 
find a Bible-believing church where Jesus is the most valuable personality, where Jesus is the one that is being promoted, and begin to fellowship with them. Find yourself a Bible. Start from John chapter 1 and begin to study. And you begin to grow. Faith comes by hearing. And hearing by the word of God. Begin to pump your faith. Grow your faith. Pump your faith. Grow your faith. And the Lord will begin to strengthen you. In Jesus name. Thank you everyone. For listening to me today. Thank you for spending time. We had a challenge at the beginning. The network was moving. Was, was, was fluctuating. But I thank God that we were able to get this done. And I'm so happy. I want you, if you are free this afternoon, to connect with me via www.32fm.com.ng. 32fm.com.ng. As I bring a powerful message on repairing broken family altars. It's going to start by 2.30 p.m. New York and Toronto time. And by 7.30 p.m., UK and West African time. It's just for 30 minutes. You'll be mightily blessed. Mightily blessed. Thank you so much, everyone. God bless you. I see you again next Sunday. Have a nice, 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 nice and great weekend.